Welcome back, everybody. As promised, in this lecture, we're going to be looking at another topic within social psychology that also stretches across all of social psychology. It's a topic of emotions, something that I'm guessing many of you have had some experiences with in your life, but maybe haven't had a chance to look at from a scientific perspective. That's what we'll be doing in this particular class. the link between emotions and social psychology, what I thought we'd do is actually take a trip back in our history of research within psychology. If you look at early philosophers and theorists trying to understand how the mind worked, a lot of them try to kind of break up the mind into different components. They talked about these things called drives or motivation. They looked at our thoughts. They looked at certain things going on in the environment. And in each theory that they presented, ones like Immanuel Kant's or the work of William James, they always had some aspect of emotions playing a role in our day-to-day -day activity. And it eventually led a very famous historical psychologist named Ernest Hilgard to talk about this thing that he called the trilogy of the mind. Hilgard concluded that when compiling all the information that we've accumulated over the years, there seems to be three main factors that people assume are really the sources of our behaviors. Our thoughts or cognitions, which we've sort of looked at in our last class, our motivations or drives, which are somewhat challenging to tackle, but you might encounter in another class, and then these things that we're going to be looking at today called emotions. And really, when we're looking at our emotions, we're looking at a big component to where our behaviors are coming from when we pair that with another very famous equation uh, the, of B equals P comma E, or B, the behavior is a function of our personality and environment. And essentially, emotions bridge the gap between personality and environment to give us a more complete sense of why we might be doing something now in a unique way that we don't do again a little bit later. Let's break this down a little bit further. So in essence, what we can say when looking at what we're doing is that our emotions are usually a player in a lot of our behaviors, but also our social world can have an impact on who we are and what we're doing. And oddly enough, our emotions can actually change the world around us. If we're angry, we might be doing something, and if we're happy, we might be doing something else. Well, on final toe, our social world can obviously impact our emotions. This last one is not necessarily a surprising thing, but it is a key element to emotions that we want to make sure we have a clear understanding on. Because making sure that we focus on emotions being situational and moment-based is a key element that separates it out from other concepts and terms that you might learn about, not only in this class, but in future classes. One of the concepts that's often tied to this idea of emotions is this other term called mood. Moods have a lot in common with emotions. We think they sort of tint our way of looking at things. One of my favorite analogies that people once gave when I heard about emotions and how they shape our behaviors is the idea that emotions and mood for that matter are kind of like stained glass where you see everything that you're encountering in pretty much the same way, but it does look different when you're experiencing a specific emotion or mood. Now, what makes a mood and an emotion different then? Well, moods are considered kind of long-lasting things. You know, you might be in a mood for a day, or you might have kind of a demeanor that brings you to a specific mood more often than not. Emotions are usually source-based. There's something that happens and it evokes a specific emotion within you, and that emotion is very short-lived. Usually when people talk about emotions in research, they talk about it in terms of seconds, not in terms of minutes or hours or days. And they're really considered kind of reactionary. 
where moods are just things that are persistent within us. And we're looking at other things that make emotions unique. One of the things that's really important to note with emotions is that these are believed by most researchers to really be the impetus behind specific actions that we commit. One very famous theorist working at UC Berkeley is a gentleman named Bob Levinson, who's spent his entire career talking about the utility and, and kind of the survival components to the emotions that we're feeling. Levinson argues that when we feel sadness over the loss of something, you know, that sadness that we're experiencing is centering. It's getting us to think about stuff in specific ways. When we feel disgust, when we walk into something that maybe is dangerous or could cause sickness, you know, that disgust is not only something that's going to get us to act, but it'll probably get us to act in a way that will increase our chances of survival. Same thing with fear, anger. All of these emotions, Levinson and other people studying emotions argue, has its utility. Even if we don't necessarily love these emotions, they do really serve a very valuable purpose. And in fact, many people who looked at emotions over the years argued that they were so valuable that maybe they might be something that's actually inherent within us. One of the first philosophers to contend that emotions are not something we should do away with, but something we should actually celebrate was a person you probably heard of, a gentleman named Charles Darwin, who, when looking at his theories of evolution, focused his attention on emotions for quite some time. He contended that emotions seemed to have a lot of value. They probably helped multiple individuals survive in multiple situations throughout any given day. And he contended that they were probably so valuable that they were probably genetically inherent within all of us. Then to test this, he argued that we should go out and determine if these things are inherent by seeing if the same emotions we're feeling in our culture are similar to the other cultures around the world that maybe have had no exposure to, in his case, the Western culture of Europe. He also argued that if they were inherent, we should see some type of biological mechanism behind them. Now, his argument was that it would probably be in our behavioral patterns, like changes in the face or changes in our heart rate. Uh, others have looked actually at changes in the brain to try to determine if there is kind of a constant behavioral pattern to all of us when we're experiencing some of the, what we call basic emotions. And this leads me to another really interesting idea that started to get floated in the 1900s, actually mid to late 1900s. This notion that we maybe do not all have the same emotions, but certain ones that are pre-programmed in us. This led to the work of a very famous psychologist named Paul Ekman, who actually spent a large portion of his career not only looking for basic emotions that seemed to be persistent in everybody in the United States and other Western cultures pretty much at the moment of birth, even though he did give a little bit of leeway and suggested that we had to usually wait until the kids were about a year old before we could really measure whether or not they could display a certain set of emotions and detect it in others as well. But Ekman also spent a decent portion of his career going to random cultures like Darwin had suggested ones that had never been exposed to people in our Western or Eastern cultures that, that had lots of collaboration with each other. And he tried to see if their facial expressions, if other behavioral patterns that they displayed were similar to ours when it came to emotions. And eventually he came to the conclusion that we probably had six basic emotions. I'm not going to go into this too much in this lecture because this is actually going to be a large component to our next module. Um, but just understand that what Ekman and Darwin were able to try to show is that we do maybe not only have emotions that are necessary for survival, but these things might be programmed in us. It might be inherent biological things that allow us to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And this brings us to that question of, well, if they're useful, how useful are they? In the last couple decades, many social psychologists have shown the utility of emotions across a wide spectrum of different situations. I know many of us have maybe striven 
to be, well, maybe most of us don't know who Spock is anymore, but a character from a very classic television show named Star Trek. Uh, this individual, uh, who maybe you're not very familiar with, was not capable of really expressing emotions. Well, as the show evolved, he actually developed some emotions as a result of I'm not going to get too nerdy on you here. Just understand that there is this kind of idea circulating around for many individuals that emotions are essentially this unnecessary thing. And they don't have much utility, and in fact, they can be problematic. And what social psychologists have shown, as I was alluding to earlier before I digressed, is that emotions do seem to have a lot of value in a lot of different situations. Many studies have shown that if we lose the ability to tap into our emotions, our relationships tend to suffer. Also, our ability to communicate with each other effectively suffers. We might not think that having an emotion in a random conversation with somebody is that valuable, but there's numerous studies that have shown that people who can't express or understand emotions well tend to be described as socially distant and tend to feel socially distant from their peers when having sorry, having conversations. This also works to not only commitment within relationships, but commitment to things like jobs or tasks at hand. Oftentimes, it's the emotions we experience when we're doing some mundane, mundane task that keeps us at it, keeps us functioning at the level we need to be in order to get to the end. There's even some research that's shown that Emotions, even though they can sometimes cause our thinking to be a little bit blurry, do tend to get us to consider lots of different things that maybe we wouldn't have considered if we didn't have those emotions evoked into us. Then some researchers have looked at specific emotions, trying to determine their specific utility. Guilt is an emotion that a number of researchers have looked at and shown that this is something that's actually tied to morality. Of social standards, ensuring that we do things that are for the good of society and probably for the good of us over the long run, even if we don't necessarily want to do the things that our guilt is drawing us to do in the first place. For survival purposes, there's numerous emotions that we have that seem to really help us avoid problematic situations. Disgust and fear, too, that are highlighted the most often. And when there's something dangerous, we tend to fear that thing and run from that thing before we even realize why we're doing it. And when something maybe is not healthy for us, it maybe will prevent us from being able to pass on our genes. We tend to feel an emotion of disgust toward those things. And when we need to find a way to survive in a dangerous situation, anger can be a very, very valuable emotion for us to feel even if maybe we're sometimes tapping into anger in ways that we shouldn't be in other situations. And there's even numerous studies that have shown that the concept of happiness, something that many of us like to pursue, is something that can be tied to longevity. Not only feeling happier more often can maybe let us live longer, but the pursuit of things that make us happy tend to be the pursuit of things that help us live longer and more fulfilled lives. In essence, what I want you to understand is that even though you can probably cite many situations where your emotions did not help you, they maybe even caused you to do something that you would regret, overall, emotions are very valuable tools that help us kind of navigate in situations where we need sometimes a nudge in certain directions. These emotions can provide that nudge. And this leads us to a really interesting question. Where are emotions coming from? Then? We just alluded to how in social situations, when emotions are evoked, they might get us to act in specific ways that maybe help us survive. So does that mean that our emotions are the precursors to our changes in what we're doing? Well, for many decades, this was just assumed to be the case. Something would happen, we'd immediately feel an emotion, and that would lead us to do something while our body was catching up. Well, let's say, for example, you're walking in the woods, you see a bear, and you immediately, when you see that bear, feel this emotion of fear, which causes you to run from the bear or get into a ball if you're doing the right thing around a bear, uh, or, you know, just 
have your heart beat and, and try to figure out what you need to do in this situation. Right? Your emotions in this folk traditional theory are the catalyst behind your reactions. Well, this idea persisted in philosophy and early psychology for a long time. And then a gentleman that you might have heard of before named William James and one of his colleagues, Lang, looked at this a little bit more closely and came to conclude that actually the nature of this relationship is the other way around. We experience something in the environment. Our body intuitively, automatically reacts. And it's our mind that eventually assesses what emotion we're feeling when we first kind of get that experience of an emotion. In essence, James and Lang suggested that emotions were more of an afterthought, a way of us compartmentalizing what it was that we just experienced. They were just a byproduct of how our body was already reacting to a situation at hand. Lasted, persisted for a decent period of time. Eventually, people started poking holes into it. They argued that, look, if something happens and your body reacts, your body might react in a way that produces one emotion one time and a completely different emotion a different time. And back to that example of a bear that we had earlier. Maybe we don't see a bear. We have our heart race and then we feel fear. Instead, we see a bear. We have our heart race. Everything's going crazy. And then we recognize the social factors at play. I want to recognize oh, maybe this bear is in the woods, so I am scared, or maybe this bear is at the zoo, so I'm happy or I'm excited, a little on edge to see this bear right next to me. Right? Two very different emotions in pretty much the same situation where our body's reacting in a similar way. This revised James Lang theory persisted for a long time until others started tinkering with it. Another group of researchers named Cannon and Baird contended through their research that maybe our physiological reactions and our emotions were actually two discrete things. Something happened, we reacted, and while we were reacting, we were also simultaneously forming emotions that could help us maybe sustain our actions or move in different ways. But their big insistence was that these things did not necessarily need to be tethered together. You could feel fear and react at the bear the same exact time. And Cannon and Baird's theory didn't necessarily get much celebration, but it did lead to another theory that was very similar to factor theory that has persisted for a very long period of time in our attempts to understand why we feel the emotions we feel. Schachter and Simger argued that essentially what happens when a, an event occurs is we, first of all, react. Our heart races. Our, our body does what it does when we see a bear. But while we're having our body react, we're also recognizing kind of the environmental conditions that are going on. We're recognizing we're at a zoo, or we're recognizing that we're, say, in the wild. And we take a moment when our body reacts and we recognize the situation to assess that. We create this cognitive interpretation and that assessment, Jector and Singer argued, leads to not only our determination of our emotion, but in, in their more important focus, it also leads to our determination of the strength of the emotion that we feel. That means we could maybe feel a little scared when we see a bear at the zoo, even though we're recognizing that it's not the same fearful conditions that we experience when we see a bear randomly in the woods wandering up to us. And this idea of Schachter and Singers led to lots of people poking and prodding at this concept to see if there was utility in it. In fact, two of the biggest people that poked and prodded at it were Schachter and Singer themselves. to try to see if there was some merit to their theory. One of my favorite studies is one that we can kind of get a glimpse into in this class. I had people come in and pretend for some inexplicable reason that they had lost the use of their arms and legs. So I asked people to participate in a study by writing their responses just with their mouth. 
And in this study, they gave people very peculiar instructions for how to write things with their mouths. Some individuals were instructed to clench a pencil or pen with their teeth and to kind of write out of the side of their head what their responses to the questions they were going to get were. Other individuals were asked to kind of purse their lips and point the pencil outward so they could draw in front of their face uh, while squeezing it with their mouth. Not their teeth in this case, but with their mouth. And what people were doing, unbeknownst to them, when they were holding the pencil, was kind of creating a face. Were there a face where they were frowning, sort of with a furrowed brow often? In other cases where they were, unbeknownst to them, smiling. A big, open mouth grin as they were holding a pencil between their teeth. Then Schachter and Singer. So they would see something like this and be asked, on a scale of 1 to 10, how pretty, how pleasant is this picture? And they had individuals do this for a series of pictures. And they took the averages from each individual to see who rated the pictures overall as more pleasant and less pleasant. And that even though we didn't necessarily recognize that our mouth was in different positions, those positions had a slight impact on our ratings of the images. This was not necessarily something that created this, this huge, robust effect where everybody who was accidentally frowning hated every picture and everybody who was forced to smile by holding the pencil with their teeth was rating everything as a 10 out of 10. But it was a robust enough effect for them to really suggest <clears throat> that our body, our, our changes in it, do play some role in our emotions that we're feeling, even if we don't necessarily recognize it. Another set of studies that they ran actually were case studies where they looked for individuals who were experiencing this thing called autonomic failure. It's essentially a system where our, our parasympathetic nervous system, the, the, the fight or flight and rest and digest system that, that changes the functioning of things like our heart and our eyes and all the other biological systems that we have in response to these different situations that we're encountering is kind of turned off. So for people who experience autonomic failure, when they are running, their heart doesn't really beat faster. When they get scared, nothing changes within their body. And what Schachter and Singer would do when interviewing these individuals who were kind of unchanged by the situation is they'd ask them to assess hypothetical scenarios, or they'd actually run them through specific scenarios and ask them to determine which emotions they were feeling and also the extent of those emotions. And what they were able to show in their studies was that even though most often these people could kind of tap in to their understanding of which emotions they were feeling, the extreme nature of the emotions that they were feeling was very difficult for them to gauge. <clears throat> they could give rough estimates that were sort of aligned with others but there was definitely a disconnect oftentimes between their ratings and the ratings of individuals who were not struggling with autonomic failure. And again, highlighted another components to their theory that maybe our understanding of the social situation had quite the role in our determinations of our emotions. One last study that was very complex, but I love to cite just because of its uniqueness and showed how these two things came together was one that they invited participants to come in and fill out a survey. But in this survey, they were either asked very boring, kind of odd questions or very offensive questions. And before they, for, fill, fill, sorry, before they filled out their responses in the survey, they were put in one of four conditions. In one condition, they were told they were about to get an injection of essentially epinephrine or something that would kind of get them excited. In another situation, they were told that they were going to get an injection of saline just as kind of a control. And half the people get being told they were going to get the epinephrine were actually given it, given this kind of energy boost. And half the people given are told they were going to give epinephrine actually got just saline. And well, the, the saline group was split in halves as well. So some that were told they were going to get saline got epinephrine, and some that were told they were going to get saline, got nothing. And then, I know this is complex, 
Uh, essentially, what they did after people were put into one of these four conditions is they were, again, given these surveys. And within the surveys, while they were filling out, there was a confederate that, in the boring condition, started acting very bored and started rolling up paper balls and throwing them at the, the other participant. And, and actually, in some cases, they were creating spitballs and, and shooting them out of straws that just so happened to be present in that room. Uh, essentially doing all these things to show their boredom. And what Schachter and Singer wanted to do was see how people would react to this. In the irritated condition, uh, questionnaire was actually very offensive. It asked questions like, how many people do you think your mother had sexual relationships with before she met your father? Um, you know, how many people do you think don't like you? Uh, things that definitely kind of caused people to be a little annoyed. And again, there was a confederate within this condition, and this person, instead of acting bored, acted very angry, did things like tore up the, the survey and, and started shouting about how poorly it was worded or, or how offensive it was. And what Schachter and Singer wanted to see, again, is how people would react to the situation, especially with the different conditions that they had been placed in. You had some that were expecting to kind of have their physiological systems get a rise when they were told that they were going to get epinephrine and others that were expecting no change from this random injection that they were for some weird reason given before they filled out the survey and what they found was that the combination of things really matters to how people reacted people thought they were going to get epinephrine that did they tended to react uh, with a rather robust reaction in both conditions they were really angry if they were given the epinephrine and were put in the irritated situation. They were really bored and started to get on edge if they were in the boring condition and the other person was doing all these things that kind of could help overcome the boredom. For those that thought they were going to get the epinephrine and were just given saline, they were actually extremely subdued. They essentially attributed any changes in their body to the epinephrine that they got. And in fact, when they didn't see as strong of a reaction as they expected, they came to the conclusion that they weren't feeling as much anger or annoyance as they expected to feel. For those that were expecting the saline that got the epinephrine, their reactions were profound. There were stories of individuals throwing stuff out of windows and shouting and yelling and doing really aggressive things. And it sort of makes sense why this would happen. If you expected no change to your body, in fact, I think they even suggested that the saline might calm them down and suddenly their heart's racing and they're in this condition, you know, the, the logical thing to conclude is that you are really angry or you're really bored and you need to do something. And if we're looking at the last condition, the saline saline condition, the responses were very similar to those that had been given the uh, well, the epinephrine and told they had gotten the epinephrine. The, their behaviors kind of aligned with what they expected and, and they just kind of reacted to the situation accordingly. All of this, I know that was a complex study, highlighted some real good evidence for the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory. But the heart of the theory was this assumption that we all reacted the same. Oftentimes, there's a lot of individual differences in terms of which emotions are evoked by people in different conditions, especially in the ambiguous situations. And it's led to constantly revise theory after theory to try to understand emotions even better than Schachter and Singer did a number of decades ago. If we're looking at kind of the most concrete theory that's out there today, it's this theory called the cognitive theory of emotions. <laughs> Essentially, combines that social cognitive world that we talked about in our last class with this emotion world. And it contends that our emotions do play a role in what we're doing and how we're reacting, but to understand the emotions that we're feeling, we have to understand the thoughts that we carry with us into these different social situations. What we think we're going to encounter, how we're trying to get something out of that situation, how we interpret things, what memories we evoke, all the stuff that we talked about in our last class. Those things are big players in the emotions that are evoked within us in those situations. And if we are able to tap into all those cognitions, 
we can have a much better sense of why there are all these individual differences in the emotions that are evoked in people in the exact same situation. It's a very complex theory, mind you, but it does give us a very good concrete understanding of how complex emotions actually are. Now, this, I think, is a good place to kind of close out especially because we're gonna be talking a little bit more about emotions in our next module. But I just wanna, in closing, kind of reiterate how important what we've covered in this module is. Much like with social cognition, emotions are things that are kind of found everywhere. They have quite the impact on all of our different behaviors across a wide range of social situations. And at the same time, it's important to again reiterate and our social world is also impacting our emotions. There's this circular relationship that's very powerful, and it's why many intro classes start with emotions and social cognition first. And if we understand those things, like social cognition and emotions, hopefully it can give us a greater understanding as to why there's so much kind of diversity in our responses across a wide range of the different things that we're going to be covering in future classes. This is going to mark the end. Make sure you're doing those writings. Make sure you're keeping up with everything that you need to for the class, like the readings, because I think we have two chapters in this module. And hopefully you'll be all caught up when I see you again for our next lecture. Take care, all.